So Larry, uh, you're associated with the idea that we are in a democratic recession. There was a special issue in 2015 of the Journal of Democracy, of which you're the co-editor, uh, where you wrote about that, uh, and you know that's been one of your big themes. Uh, so tell us a little bit about it, and, and where are we in that recession? Is it getting worse? Are there signs that it may be easing up, or what? Well, between about 19... 75 and 2005, there was a long period of unprecedented expansion in the number of democracies in the world and in overall levels of freedom in the world. It was the best period in world history for democracy and freedom. Uh, it wasn't continuous, it was slow for a while in the 1970s and early 80s. Then, of course, it accelerated with the fall of the wall in 1989, then the collapse of the Soviet Union, the second liberation in Africa, and the burst of new democracies there. And then it tailed off to a more gradual uh, expansion. Around 2006, it just drew to a halt. Democratic expansion stopped in the world, and we began to see a pattern, which Freedom House has documented, where in each of the last 10 years, from 2006 through the end of 2015, in each of those years, many more countries declined in their level of freedom, political rights or civil liberties, than improved. And it wasn't only that, it was also the qualitative dimension of many democracies slipping back to more uh, illiberal practices of um, uh, regulation of the media, regulation of the internet, uh, constraints on and regulation of civil society in ways I think, and many others as well, are not fully captured in the Freedom House freedom ratings. And we've basically stopped seeing a net expansion of democracy in the world. There have been some gains for democracy in many years. Cote d'Ivoire has become a democracy. Uh, Mali has returned uh, to democracy. But democracy has slipped away or been suspended in some very big and strategic countries. Recently in Bangladesh, as a result of an election that wasn't fairly administered, and very crucially in Turkey, as a result of the gra uh, strengthening noose uh, around civil liberties and media freedom by the government of uh, President Erdogan. Moreover, uh, there's something else that's going on in recent years that we've documented in the Journal of Democracy and in a book we've just done, uh, Chris Walker, Mark Platner, and myself, uh, that's coming out now called Authoritarianism Goes Global. So what is the globalization of authoritarianism it inv involve? It involves uh, an increasingly sophisticated and energetic effort by the big entrenched authoritarian regimes, Russia, China, Iran, as well as others like Venezuela, to be more creative and more, in a way, ferocious in their closure of space for civil society and in their repression of the internet and their co-optation of any independent media or civil society that they succeed in not having to repress. It involves very sophisticated new generation efforts at propaganda using fake Twitter accounts, uh, faux social media, uh, and uh, pseudo-electoral observation organizations, kind of mimicking the techniques of the West to monitor democracy, but now with an authoritarian mission. And it involves spending a lot of money with real sophistication to promote their stories, their interpretation of the news, often their fictionalized accounts of the news, usually to discredit the United States and other Western democracy promotion efforts. The Western democracies have not responded with similar investments in technology and certainly not with similar investments in resources. 
Our public diplomacy efforts, I think, have waned uh, technologically and in terms of resources. Our democracy assistance efforts uh, fiscally uh, have not kept up with the investments that Russia and China are making in particular. And as you've been noting in your writing and others as well, the established democracies are not doing well. They're not effective in their performance. They're polarized. They're now riddled with shallow, uh, ethnocentric, populist appeals. Not only Donald Trump in the United States, but uh, Marine Le Pen in France, the Swiss Popular Party, the United Kingdom Independence Party, and there's an anti-immigrant, xenophobic wave uh, surging across Europe, as a result of which the image of democracy is suffering in the world because many people are looking at what's happening in Europe and North America and saying, well, if this is what's going on in the established democracies, maybe democracy isn't the best form of government. Or if it's a form of government that harbors prejudice toward us, maybe it's not the form of government we want. Mm -hmm. So. I wouldn't say we are in what Samuel Huntington called a reverse wave in which it's a crisis of democratic setbacks, but we've been in a long 10-year slump that I think is showing many signs of getting worse. What do you think about um, the collapse of, of energy prices? Uh, because this is something you've written about in the past, there has been this correlation between high energy and commodity prices and lack of democracy in a key number of authoritarian countries. Uh, do you think that this global collapse is going to affect the global politics uh, of authoritarianism down the road? Yes, uh, I do, Frank, and I think we're um, already seeing some signs of it, most especially in Venezuela, where the Venezuelan Petro state, which is now almost completely dependent on oil revenue and has seen its revenue decline by probably 70% is in a massive fiscal crisis. We know that uh, Vladimir Putin uh, is suffering a very serious fiscal crisis of the state in Russia, with Russia having long since become mainly just another petro state, uh, largely dependent on oil and gas revenues. There really isn't an engine of economic growth beyond that. And um, I think it will be felt ultimately in Saudi Arabia, uh, in Iran, and in other oil dependent uh, authoritarian states as well. I think the decline of oil prices contributed to the rotation of power in Nigeria, the first successful free and fair election that turned out a sitting government in the more than um, 50-year history of Nigeria as an independent nation. So the decline in oil prices is creating opportunities but, and undermining existing authoritarian regimes. But here's the problem that you know so well. If one of the requirements for a successful democracy is an effective state and a functioning economy, and the way you get to the end of authoritarian rule is the implosion of the economy and by extension, and this is really, I think, the risk now very palpably in Venezuela, the implosion of the state, you may get a demise of the authoritarian regime and even the possible uh, turn toward a popularly elected government, but it's a mode of transition that creates enormous obstacles for success because the state has been devastated, the economy's been devastated, and a new democracy has to pick up the pieces. All right, well, let's, um, let's hope that the kind of good underlying economic trends, you know, <laughs> produce some real political, uh, political impacts down the road.